Good morning. I'll try that again. Good morning. All right, that's better. It's good to have everyone here to LFC this morning. Uh, just uh, wanted to share a couple things with you. We have blue cards in the uh, key racks in front of you. We'd encourage you to grab one of those cards. If there's any prayer requests or things you'd like to share, please fill that out. It's a way for us to, as a church staff, to be in praying for needs here at LFC, but uh, also just to communicate anything that's going on. Uh, also, if you're, you're new here, we'd love for you to fill out the other side, which provides some uh, information, contact information for us to be able to share things that are happening, events, um, ministries that you're looking to get involved in. You can definitely glance through our bulletin. There's quite a bit there of different ways to plug in here at LFC. So I want to especially welcome you if you're visiting with us for the first time. We also have some children's services available. We have a junior church ministry that happens during the uh, sermon. We also have the nursery care down the hallway, a sensory friendly worship room, and we also have a cry room over here. So just make, make use of any of those as needed. Uh, our ushers are happy to help you with anything that you need. So please uh, see one of the ushers. I want to wish everyone a happy Father's Day. Uh, or in the words of my daughter this morning, happy Mother's Day, Dad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so great. I just want to, want to welcome all the, or wish the fathers all a happy Father's Day for sure. I uh, want to also mention Family Promise uh, is having, uh, the, the homeless ministry is going to be hosting families here. What a great opportunity here to serve uh, local families in need. That's uh, the 20th to the 26th. If you're interested in helping uh, show the love of Christ to these families, please outside in the Welcome Center area, uh, please sign up to help. Uh, there's just a, a great opportunity we have. We have so many different opportunities here in LFC to be the body of Christ, and this is uh, definitely one of those. Also want to mention that we have our combined worship services starting July 2nd. So please be sure, 9.30, uh, July 2nd, we start with that. Uh, I'm actually going to invite up Pastor Ryan, uh, and there he is, and uh, also the rest of the New, ha New Hampshire missions team. If they can come up at this time, uh, we have a few of them that are here this morning, and uh, we're going to have an opportunity to hear a little bit more about what they're doing and also pray for them as a team. So. So we're very excited to be leaving on Tuesday to take this group up to New Hampshire and uh, partner alongside a church in Winchester, New Hampshire. Uh, we'll be staying at Camp Spofford, and part of uh, Camp Spofford's desire is, if you're familiar with Camp Spofford, it's a wonderful Christian camp, uh, but their desire is to take the gospel uh, out into the community as well, and the community of Winchester is is in need of the gospel as well, and so we're excited to be able to partner with a church there to help them with their VBS program. And our team, our students will in particular be, uh, they'll be buddies to uh, many of the students who are at the VBS program and the, the intent is for them to be able to just have gospel conversations, to talk with the kids, to talk life, uh, but to, certainly to share their faith in, in Christ Jesus. So we're excited. Uh, we have Lisa Calbline and Diane Ambrosi who are also going as leaders and we have um, Kaylee Deming, Zach Ball, Janelle Faber, Aiden Ingram, and Sarah Clark, and we also have uh, Sarah Lorena, uh, who will be going on the trip, and then um, Abby and Joseph Kesselring, they come, they come to youth group regularly. And uh, so we're excited to have a, a great team of, of people going on the trip. So I think we're going to go ahead and pray. In Colossians, the Apostle Paul um, really asks the church to pray, to be devoted to prayer. So at this time, we're going to be praying for uh, this team as they head out, really excited about the opportunity God's placed in front of them uh, to be the hands and feet of Jesus uh, to a hurting and a broken world. So I thought I would read this prayer and, uh, and just close with a, a brief time of prayer. Starting in verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may pro proclaim it clearly, as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. I would actually like to ask the church to stand in, uh, in unity with, these, with this team that's getting ready to uh, go out on Tuesday to um, be Christ's ambassadors. So let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunities you've given us to be your hands and your feet, to be your ambassadors. 
And we pray for this team, Lord, this team uh, of 11 that's heading out from here on Tuesday. Uh, we pray for safety as they head up uh, to New Hampshire. We pray, Lord, that you would provide them opportunities, uh, open doors as they uh, interact with kids and community members. We pray that they'd be able to proclaim Christ clearly. Give them wisdom in their conversations, Father. Help them to be flexible and to understand um, that you're in control, Lord, and uh, that you will do great things. And we also pray for Center Church, the church that we're partnering with. We pray, Lord, for, for that ministry, Pastor Jeremy and all of the, the folks there. We pray, Lord, that we would be a blessing to them and we'd come alongside them and partner as we look to serve your kingdom together. In Christ's name we pray these things.
Let's continue in prayer. You are worthy. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our worship. We are so humbled to be a, allowed to come before your throne in prayer. For you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And as we celebrate Father's Day today, we can't think of a better example of a father than our Heavenly Father who loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. While we were yet sinners, he still loved us. And he died for us so that we could be reunited with you. Lord, may we never take our salvation for granted. But may we strive as dads to be the best fathers we can be. Lord, I thank you for each one of the men here that are dads, grandpas, uncles, godly men who've just influenced a young man or girl's heart. Lord, there's so many in this church that though they may not even have children, they've been extended godly fathers to our kids. I thank you for each one of these men. I thank you for the impact they've had on my children and the other children of this church, Lord. May we all be the godly men you want us to be this week, this year to come. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of lifting needs up to you in prayer, Lord, and we lift up to you Sheila Hoyton, who's down in Morristown with some cardiac issues, Lord. We just ask you to continue to guide and uh, just guide the doctors as they make decisions, Lord. We ask for healing for strength, for patience. Lord, we lift up to you, Nick Van Borum, Lord, and we just thank you for protecting him the other night, Lord, when he was rushed in for emergency surgery on his appendix, Lord. We thank you that it went well. We thank you for providing the doctors and nurses that so quickly could tend to him. Be with him as he recovers now at home, Lord, as he has to be still for a while, Lord, give him the patience for a quick recovery. Lord, we thank you for the chance to be the hands and feet of Christ. And Lord, we think of Family Promise we will be coming this week, Lord, the ministry for, to those that are without a home, something we can take for granted. Lord, may we not just be a shelter here this week for the one family that's coming, but Lord, may we be a home that loves on them and shares our comforts with them, breaks bread with them, that they would see you, Lord, and not us this week. And Lord, we lift up to our missionaries, Greg and Julianne Allen, Lord, as they serve with Global Serve, Lord, we just ask you to continue to use them greatly in their mission field, Lord. We thank you for their enthusiasm to serve you, Lord. We ask you to watch over them, protect them, use them for your honor and glory. And Lord, we, we think of Pastor Joel up at Sussex Christian Reform, Lord, as they meet today, Lord, give them an awesome day of worship, that they would come there hungry for you, Lord, and you would just let your words flow through Pastor Joel. We thank you for our friendship with them and our partnership with them in ministry. Bless them today, Lord. And Lord, we lift up to you, Pastor Aaron, now as he's going to come forth and share the message you've put on his heart. Help us to put all our distractions away and to the side and to be able to focus in on you as we worship you through studying of your word. And we give back to you in another portion of our worship through our tithes and offering. 
Lord, we ask that you use that for your honor and for your glory. We love you. We thank you. And we pray all these things in that precious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Today I'm going to sing How Great Thou Art, and sometimes at the nursing home where I worship and uh, I lead uh, singing as a chaplain, we sometimes don't have the music to go along with the words. So today we're going to do it that same way, just the music, just the voices singing, and since I'm only one voice, your, your voices are going to join me. So sing along with me, How Great Thou Art. O oh Lord my God. When I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then i shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my god how great thou art then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Amen. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, choir. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, if you would turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3, and while you're turning there, just wanted to highlight a couple of important things. Uh, first of all, uh, we want to encourage you to be praying for Ryan, Pastor Ryan and his family, as Ryan is going on a scheduled sabbatical for the months of July, August, and September. One of the great blessings that you provide as a church family for the pastor's 
on staff is uh, the, the gift of a sabbatical every six years of service. And Ryan served uh, several more years than that, but uh, he was adopting little baby Ellie, had their hands full the year that uh, was his scheduled sabbatical. So he's going to be taking his sabbatical July, August, and September. This is uh, hopefully not only a gift to uh, Ryan, but also a gift to the congregation as those three months he'll be doing a combination of serving um, of learning and also of a, a good portion of the time of relaxing and taking a, a much needed break. And so he will be starting that the very first week in July. And so um, be praying for him and wish him well. I'm excited for uh, his opportunities over the course of the summer. Uh, it's been a real blessing as the senior pastor on staff to see Ryan prepare so well. Um, everything is covered so well for the summer. So many leaders have stepped up, and it will be, uh, it'll be seamless. It'll be like he's not even gone, which I don't know if that's good for him or not. Uh, but he's done a great job. I think actually he has probably uh, worked the extra three months getting ready for the three months he's going to be gone. He's worked diligently. And again, thank you for all the folks who stepped up and are going to serve in the different areas that Ryan oversees over the course of the, of the summer. So uh, again, be praying for him. Also want to encourage you, hope you saw in your bulletin, uh, something this summer coming up that I hope many of you will jump on. I think it's going to be a, a really fun opportunity for some good fellowship in the summer. One of the reasons that we have a combined service in the summer is so that uh, we have an opportunity as two services to come together for you to sometimes meet people or fellowship with people, certainly worship with folks in this church body that you don't see from time to time and often don't see at all. It's, it's really funny how amazing uh, it is that at times I'll introduce people and they have been coming to this church for years and years, but one is a regular first service attender and the other is a regular second service attender. They don't know each other. They don't know that they're a fellow church members. I hear stories occasionally of you running into a fellow church member in the grocery store. You get to talking and you go to LFC. I've gone for 10 years. Me too. You just go to different services. And so one of the fun things that we want to do this summer as we promote fellowship and enjoy our time worshiping together is something we're calling Summer 2 by 4 And you'll notice the announcement there in your bulletin. This is just a very low-key opportunity for you to have some good fellowship this summer with folks that you may not know who are part of your church family. Summer 2 by 4 simply works like this. If you would like to be a part... We'd invite you to go at the Welcome Center, fill out one of these cards, or you can go online, and it's right there on one of the banners. You can sign up online. Uh, and basically what we will do is everyone who would like to participate, we will put four individuals, couples, or families, four of you together, and we encourage you to do two things each month together. We'll, have, we'll put you together for the month of July, and then we'll put a new batch of two by four groups together for the month of August. And all we will do here in the church office is we will do our best to mix you up with people you do not know. People that maybe we know go to the first, second service. If you go to the first service, our goal is to mix couples up with families, with single individuals. And simply, once we have you together, we'll give all of you, through the contact information, the names and numbers of each other, and we encourage you on your own to figure out two times during each month to get together. What you do, of course, is up to you. Where you meet is up to you. How you do it is up to you. We just want to facilitate and be a part of you enjoying some fellowship and some fun this morning with your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And so, um, we encourage you to, again, do a couple of things. You can go out to the Welcome Center. There are cards right there. All we're asking is for your name, the uh, number of people in your family, or if you're an individual or a couple, and just the best contact information, and we will get you that information, and you enjoy yourselves this summer. So uh, we'll sign that up for the next couple of weeks, and then we'll have a new sign up in the middle of July for August. And again, we hope that some of you will take advantage of that and enjoy the opportunity we have in the summer to maybe slow down a bit and to fellowship together. Well, let's pray, and then we will jump into the Word of God this morning. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Uh, Lord, every day is a blessing, but Father, Sunday is a, a special day as we gather and we celebrate the resurrection of, of Jesus and we uh, celebrate what it means to be a church family. And we commune together and we enjoy each other's fellowship. We encourage one another. Lord, this is a special day and we thank you for the opportunity to be together as a church family. Father, we uh, pray now as we open up your word that, uh, Holy Spirit, you would help us to apply this to our lives. Lord, that we would live up to, uh, live up to its commands, that we would uh, love this word and that we would love living it out because we love you, Jesus. Father, bless this time, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning I want us to look at a passage of Scripture in Daniel chapter 3 that is a very familiar, well-known passage of Scripture. Unfortunately, we all too often look at the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego simply as almost a children's story. We kind of take it as, a, as a, a picture book story and we really fail to realize the depth and the truth that this word has for us. I especially like this passage of scripture because of all the examples of some godly men, these three young men are prime examples of what it means to walk by faith, of what it means to be men of God. This morning we celebrate Father's Day, and it is a wonderful day to celebrate the blessings of being a dad, the blessings of dads, the blessings of influential men. I could tell you growing up, I have shared this often, I had a wonderful dad, but he wasn't a believer, but it was the men in my church that stepped up and were spiritual fathers to me that really made some of the biggest differences in my life. I'm so grateful and, and was so blessed with a wonderful dad. I couldn't have asked for a better dad, but my RA leaders, which was like our uh, uh, boys brigade in the church I grew up in, my Sunday school teachers, the fathers of some some of my friends I really stood the test of what it means to be a, a man of God. And it was amazing the blessing of how they passed that on to me. We live in a culture that is really hard pressed to define what manhood is well, don't we? We live in a culture that defines manhood in so many different ways. We live in a culture, quite frankly, that at its very heart and soul and core wants to emasculate men, wants to set aside biblical and traditional manhood for a feminized version that looks nothing like what real men were created to be and certainly what the biblical call to manhood is. We have little glimpses of it in culture, but the best glimpse, of course, is in the Scripture itself. I read a few years ago, standing in a bookstore, a book and skimmed through called The Man's Worst Case Scenario Survival Handbook. And it was kind of a tongue-in-cheek manual written, though, in quite a factual tone based on interviews of people in all of these different areas. <clears throat> it's, again, supposed to be a, a funny book, but it really addressed some of the things that perhaps our culture would say make a, man, make a man a man. In other words, some of the chapters included things like how to fend off a shark, how to take a punch, how to deliver a baby in a taxi cab, how to survive a poisonous snake attack, how to jump from a moving car, how to identify a bomb, all of these manly, manly things. One of them that stuck with me was, though, this, and I'm going to give you a test, man. I want to see how manly you are. Uh, what would you do if you were confronted by an angry mountain lion? Any ideas? A, would you, would you run? B, would you play dead? Three, would you hold your coat open like a cape? Or four, would you sing a gentle, happy song? <laughs> Any ideas? Men? I want to see how manly you are. Three. Anybody else? Three. If you say four, you lose your man card. <laughs> You're exactly right. We got some manly men, manly men here. You hold your coat open and act like a cape. Act like a cape. Make yourself big. The idea is that if you look bigger, you have more of a chance of intimidating the lion or at least looking like you're too big to swallow, I guess. I don't know. 
But this is what the authors say. The principle behind this book is a simple one. You just never know. You never really know what life will throw at you, what is sitting around the corner. You never really know when you might be called upon to choose life or death with your actions. But as a man, when you are called, you need to know what to do. That's why this book is written. (laughs) Well, I'd say that's a pretty good reason, men, in part why this book was written. Because indeed, we don't know what life brings, but we have the manual for how to live, certainly as godly men, and of course, as as godly followers, men and women, young men and young women of God. And so I want us to look at this story, again, that we know well of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I want us to look at how these three young men exemplified godly manhood. Now, as we read the book of Daniel, we can really be distracted by these stories that we know well. And we get distracted by what some think is prophecy or future prophecy in the book of Daniel. But really, the, the book of Daniel's theme is the sovereignty of God. God, the book of Daniel tells us, is in control, that God is faithful and able to save those who are faithful to him, even from death. On a broader picture, the book of Daniel reminds us that God is in control of earthly empires, that God is, uh, is using even the actions of evil men and evil empires to further his plan. And we see that God, in his sovereignty, is in control and is able to protect and use men and women, people who are faithful to him. Now, this particular story in chapter 3 of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the, the fiery furnace, takes place in the time of exile when the Jewish people were in exile. King Nebuchadnezzar had taken the best and the brightest of the young men especially uh, to Babylon. Four of the best known young men of Israel who had been taken into exile were Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These four young men had been promoted to high places of authority in Babylon. It was at this time... <clears throat> that King Nebuchadnezzar had a huge statue made. And we'll read about that in chapter 3. And his goal was for this statue to be worshipped. We don't know what this statue was, if it was a statue of a god, if it was a statue of Nebuchadnezzar himself. But we know that he was calling on all of the people <clears throat> to bow down and to worship this idol. This is what life threw at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the challenge and the question is, will they be faithful? And of course they are. They understood the ultimate survival guide to godly manhood. So the question as we look through this passage is this, how can we look at these three young men, their example, and what are some principles that we can take so that when we face the unexpected, when we go through the fire, how can we remain faithful servants, faithful men, and and ladies, certainly faithful women of God? Well, first and foremost, we need to understand this, and this was at the heart of these three young men. We must have conviction. We must have conviction. I want to begin this morning in verse 13. And again, the backstory is that that Nebuchadnezzar had, had laid out a decree that when all of the instruments of the great orchestra of the king were, were, to, were playing, that everyone was to bow down and they were to worship. And of course, we know as the story goes that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, though they were in the king's service, refused to bow down. And very interestingly, the very astrologers 
who Daniel had earlier saved by giving the king an answer to his dream when they couldn't. Their lives were spared because Daniel, another faithful Israelite, gave an interpretation to the king. These very same astrologers, when they saw these additional three Jewish young men who were friends and, and cohorts of Daniel, when, he, when they saw them not bowing down, they went and they tattled. They told on them. They threw them under the bus. And so we will pick up the story in verse 13 when King Nebuchadnezzar finds out that these three young men refused to bow. Verse 13, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, were face to face with the decision. And the decision was in essence this, do we bow or do we burn? And it's very tempting in a situation like this to perhaps look at them and say, just bow. Just this one time, don't be such fanatics. You don't have to mean it. What will it hurt if you just bow? But these three men had conviction. I think the moment of truth is in verse 14 when the king addresses them and he says this, Is it true? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up. It is one thing to follow Christ and to have conviction in a place like this. It's one thing to live for Christ, to have conviction when you're in a comfortable setting of your home. But it's a very different thing out there when the world when someone challenges you, when you're face to face with an opportunity to compromise and to bow, and someone says, is it true? Is it true that you will not bow? Is it true that Christ is your ultimate love? Is it true that you're a man or a woman of righteousness? Is it true? And this amazing moment of truth for Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, see these three men saying, we do not need to defend yourselves, ourselves before you in this matter. In other words, their actions, their lives spoke for themselves. And don't think there wasn't a lot of pressure the king's reputation was on the line. This was a man who was perhaps one of the most brutal, ruthless leaders in all of human history. He had made a decree. His decree was that everyone would bow. And then the king makes perhaps the greatest misstatement in this entire passage in verse 15. This is the understanding of a man who does not have conviction. He says again in verse 15, I love it, then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? And of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, know, Abednego knew exactly what God would be able to rescue them. When we talk about conviction, the conviction that these three men had, what does that mean? Con conviction it means to have a set of beliefs and standards that guide our actions. Not when it's convenient, not when it's safe, not when it's easy, 
but a set of beliefs and standards that guide every area of our life. And what was it that guided the beliefs and standards of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? It was the very word of God. It was their faith in God. Remember what God had said. This was one of the big commands. You will have no other gods before me. The very word of God. God said in his word to his people in his law, I am the one true and holy God. God had said to his people, if you worship idols, you will die. And Nebuchadnezzar was saying the exact opposite. Worship my idol or you will die. And it's amazing that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were determined to flee from idolatry, even if it meant death. That is conviction. I would say to you that this world, our culture, the church, needs nothing more than men and women who will stand up and live by conviction. Living by conviction happens the moment that you and I decide that God is more real and important than anything else. My challenge to you, and I would say this is especially needed, men, in our culture, in our churches, in our families, we need nothing more than men who will live by conviction and lead their families by conviction. Conviction based on God's word and conviction based on our faith in Jesus. We need to, 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 to step up and we need to live life transformed by what we believe. And you know what? Especially men in this culture, we need each other to do that. That's why church is so vital. That's why men's Bible studies are so vital. That's why accountability groups with men you trust are so vital. That's why coming and being in a Sunday school class and listening to preaching and reading the Word of God and memorizing the Word is so important. Because there comes a time in all of our lives that we choose, and often multiple times throughout the day, that we choose to either bow or to not. Let's be men of conviction and encourage one another to be conviction. So we see in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego this powerful example of what it means to be a a, a people of conviction. Secondly, we see this. Based on their conviction, number two, we see that they were men of courage. We want to to be faithful and to not bow and remain faithful in the face of fire. Then we need to, number two, have courage. Look at verses 17 and 18. This response is amazing. They say, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, that God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Can you imagine the conviction that led to the courage that these three men had? Once you have conviction, it's not enough. Conviction is the, 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 the belief of the heart. Courage is the, the belief of the heart turned into action. The challenge is there will, have, there will be times in our life when we'll have to take our convictions and take a step sometimes into the fire. And the great question is, are we prepared to live lives of courage? Courage basically is this. Courage says that no matter the cost, I'm going to act on my conviction. It's amazing, isn't it? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is the perfect picture of trust in God's sovereignty. Because remember, that really is the theme of the book of Daniel. They believe God is in control. It's also a picture of incredible faith. They believe that God is able, that he is able. Now, don't miss this. They didn't say that God will deliver us. Look there in verse 17. We believe that God is able. 
a trust in God's sovereign power. But then in verse 18, this is faith. This is courage. But even if he does not, an understanding that sometimes what we want doesn't line up completely with God's will, that in God's sovereignty, his plan is better and greater. But even if he does not, in verse 18, we want you to know, your majesty, we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. What an act of courage. Courage is born not only of conviction, but courage is born only when you trust that God is bigger and his plan is better. That's the only way that we have faith to step through the fire. We have to believe that God is bigger and we have to believe that his plan is better, that his sovereignty is best, his plan and his, his, uh, his working in us, whatever it is, is better. How can you and I act with courage when we face the fire? Well, number one, we need to know what we believe and why. That's what strikes me about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They knew what they believed about God. They knew that he was able but they also knew that he was sovereign. You need to know what you believe and why. That's why we must be a people of the word, why we must spend time in the word. Number two, how, how do we have courage when we face the fire? Number two, I'd encourage you to build and work up your spiritual muscle. Be faithful in the little things and your courage and your conviction will grow. We need, know that Daniel, we know that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that that remnant of faithful Israelites in Babylon <coughs> were faithful in what they ate and what they didn't eat. If you read the story before chapter 3, we know that though they were in a foreign land, they were distinctively obedient to God. They flexed their spiritual muscles. They were faithful in the little things. So it is no surprise, and it is not out of the blue, that these three men were willing to die rather than to bow down because they had built up their faith, their spiritual muscle. God had blessed them as they had been more and more faithful. I'd encourage you, number three, if we want to act with courage, then to depend on the Holy Spirit to depend on the Holy Spirit. Christians, we live in an age where God himself is in us. We have, because of the Holy Spirit, Christ in us, the strength to do anything he has called us to do. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And the all things that Paul is talking about is that ability to be content and faithful no matter the circumstance or the difficulties. We have Christ in us. The Holy Spirit enables us. And then finally, and I would encourage you with this, how can you act with courage when you face the fire? I'd say, number four, it's this. Love Jesus more than comfort or safety. That's at the heart of what I was communicating last week. You want to be faithful. You want to be an overcomer. You want to overcome temptation. You want to stay faithful to your spiritual commitments. Then you must love Jesus more than you love comfort and more than you love safety. Because without a deep and abiding love for Jesus that comes through digging in the word, praying, being faithful, loving him more, then we will love. We, as human beings, we will always love comfort more. We will always love safety more. That's why sanctification is not about doing this and not doing this first and foremost, Sanctification, the, the ability to stand firm and strong, comes because our will and our mind and our hearts have been changed because we love Jesus more than anything else the world offers. And it's when we love Jesus more that we begin to, to see comfort and safety and temptation as things that don't have as much appeal. We love Jesus more. Therefore, the overflow of our love is we want to be obedient. We want to keep our spiritual commitments. We want to even be willing 
to go through the fire for him. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had conviction. That conviction turned into courage. And finally, we see this. Because of the courage we find in Christ, we can finally have confidence. You want to walk through the fire? Have confidence. Have confidence. I love how the story ends. These three young men had confidence in God. They stuck to their convictions. They acted out those convictions in courage. He knew that, that ultimately God would be faithful, whatever that meant. And then we see God step in. I want to just finish reading the rest of the story, though we're very familiar with it. Then Nebuchadnezzar, starting in verse 19, was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. <clears throat> the king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own God. That's the reason we have confidence that God is always with us, that he'll never leave us or forsake us. We can't take this story and turn it into a moral tale that it is not. The moral tale that it is not is that if we'll be faithful, everything will be fine. There'll be no pain in life. We know throughout Christian history, throughout biblical history, men and women who have stood firm on their convictions have suffered and have died. We know in this world today that there are believers in places like the Sudan and Syria and across this world who stand for Christ and they die brutal deaths for their faith. The principle we take from this story isn't that God will always deliver us unharmed through the fire, but the point is the fourth man in the furnace. The truth and the point of this is that God is faithful. He never leaves us or forsakes us. Most scholars believe that that fourth person in the furnace was a pre-incarnate uh, uh, Jesus Christ, the Son, that He had come, that God Himself was with them. And if you think about it, God didn't have to show up. The second person of the Trinity, the Son, Jesus pre-incarnate, didn't have to show up in the flames to save Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He didn't have to be there. God in His sovereign power could have simply saved them. So what's the point? What's the picture? What's the reminder? The reminder is have confidence, have courage, have conviction, because no matter where you are in the fire, God is with you. He is faithful. The decision 
we make is not, do I believe that God will be there? He will be there. The decision is, will I serve God and stay true to my convictions, or will I bow my knee to the God of acceptance, comfort, convenience, or what makes me feel good? If we'll truly believe and understand that God will never leave us or forsake us, if we really believe that, then we will have the confidence to be the kind of fathers, the kind of dads, the kind of men that our families, our church, and our culture needs. Certainly, if you believe that, we'll learn to be the followers of Christ that, that make a difference. Ultimately, we trust and we know that God is bigger, His plan is better, and if we will learn to love Him more than anything else in the world, comfort, popularity, what our coworkers or our, our fellow students think of us, if we will learn to love and trust Jesus more than what is tempting, what is attractive, what appeals to the flesh. If, if we'll learn to love Jesus more and trust him more than anything this world has to offer, we will, no matter being in the fire, experience the presence and the power and the enabling presence of, of God in us. And so the great challenge for us as believers is will we be men and women, young men and young women, will be boys and girls of conviction, courage, and confidence. God calls us to do that and to be that, and anything God calls us to do or to be, He equips us to do and to be. So as we close, I would just encourage you to do this. Flex your spiritual muscles. Trust Him in the little things. Grow deeper in love with Him day by day. Be obedient in what may seem like the small things. Stand for what is right at school and your family, at work. Trust Him. Grow to love Him more than all of the things this world has to offer. And then when you go through a real trial you will find that God is faithful. You'll find that you love Jesus more than whatever is tempting you, whatever is trying to singe your, your toes. And you will choose to walk with God and to be men and, and women of, of conviction. I would say this morning also, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've never experienced uh, this type of, of confident uh, relationship with the God of the universe, He is offering you this morning the opportunity for Him to dwell in your heart. That's an incredible picture, isn't it? Of Jesus in the fire. Jesus with you no matter what life brings. That's one of the great gifts of following after Jesus and trusting him by faith is that he will never leave you, forsake you. He'll walk with you through the struggles and the trials of life. He'll take your struggles and trials and circumstances and he will transform them into something purposeful and good. Every believer needs to understand that God has a plan for your life. And if you don't know Jesus is your Lord and Savior, he has a plan for your life. That first plan is to know him to have your sins forgiven and to know that when you leave this earth, you'll spend eternity in heaven with him. If you don't know him, we invite you this morning to trust and place your faith in him, repent from your sin, and give your life fully to Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And then finally, if you know him, encourage one another to be men and women of conviction. Pray for each other. Keep each other accountable. And let's be Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Let's, let's walk with him no matter where life takes us. Well, this morning as we wrap up this service, I want to encourage some people in our congregation who are walking a, a new journey and a, a new path, a new step, and those are our graduates. And I think it's very appropriate that... Uh, we have an opportunity to open God's Word and read about three young men of conviction 
and our prayer for all of you who are graduates uh, this year, that you would walk as young men and young women of conviction. That no matter where life takes you, no matter what your next step is, either in education or working, whatever it is, that, uh, that God would use you to be men and women that honor Him and, uh, and uh, are, are honored by your lives. We'd like to invite, if you would right now, if you are a graduate, and the full list of our graduates are at the uh, Welp- Welcome Center. Um, if you are here and you are a graduate, we'd invite you, you first of all, to stand right where you're at. All right. This is an excellent crew. First of all, we want to congratulate you. Congratulations. Next, we would like to do more than just congratulate you. We would like to bless you and pray for you and encourage you. And I'd like to invite Glenn if he would come up. And as he's coming up, if you are, you guys got to remain standing. I am so sorry. I want uh, those of you who uh, are around these graduates, first and foremost, mom, dads, brothers, sisters, family, I'd invite you, if you would, for a moment to stand up beside them. And we would invite you uh, to, and if you're not close enough, move towards them. And we'd invite you just simply to lay hands on your graduate, all right? And, you know, laying on of hands is an ancient Christian a symbol and practice of showing support and love, acknowledging the touch of God on people's lives. It's a beautiful picture of, uh, of God's presence and empowerment in our lives. And so we do that, not because anything magical happens, but it's just a beautiful picture of, uh, of God at work in us. And so you see these families gathered around their graduates. Uh, I would invite you, if you're nearby also, and you would like to stand, you don't have to, but if you'd like to turn, stand, and, and lay hands and encourage these graduates as we pray, I'd invite you to do that as well. And this will actually be the way we close our service this morning, um, by uh, praying for these graduates, praying for their families, and asking that God would continue to develop these men and women into uh, young men and women, a character of godliness. And uh, as we pray, uh, again, look around and keep these folks in your mind. And let's uh, finish our time together this morning as a, as a church family lifting up these graduates before the Lord. Glenn? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I couldn't think of a better way to celebrate your day today by lifting up to you these young men and women who are moving on to uh, another chapter in their life, Lord. Lord, I ask you to use them, whether it be in junior high, high school, college, or for those that are going off into the workforce, so that you would use them on their campuses, use them in their workplaces, that they would be a light for you, Lord. We thank you for the knowledge that you've given them through their life, through the teachers that have just poured themselves into these children. Lord, we thank you for being a, let us be a part of their lives here, Lord. We love each and every one so much. We're proud of each and every one of them. But Lord, we're excited for the fact that we know most of them love you, Lord, and they want to use the gifts and talents that you've given them for your honor and for your glory. And so, Lord, we ask you to guide them. Put your arms around them. Protect them wherever they might be going, Lord. And help us as a church to be there for them, to support them, to encourage them, to love on them, Lord. And, Lord, we look forward to seeing what you're going to do through their lives. May we all have the courage of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as we go forth this week, whether it be into those new places we just talked about for those that are graduating, or ourselves as we go out into the community, out into our workplaces, out into our families, may we have the courage to stand for you, to impact this world for you. We love you, we thank you, we praise you, Lord for all that you do for us and all that you give us. 
And it's in your precious and powerful name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.